three. You say question twelve. Uh, yeah. This one, yeah, this was the newish one. I um, think if you paid a lot of attention to a particular homework question, you could have gotten it. Because um, two of these arrangements actually look like something you saw in the homework. Like A and D look like something you have seen in homework, right? And um, you got that the effective spring constant of arrangements, both A and D, is twice the spring constant of a single thing. All right? So B is the challenging one. It, uh, uh, somehow the effective spring constant works out to be half of, one, of one spring. And um, this is how you would have analyzed it, seeing it for the first time. When you want to try to figure out the effective spring constant of anything, your goal is to write down uh, something that looks like uh, uh, Hooke's law equation. So you want to be able to say net force is, um, you want to say that's proportional to some kind of displacement. And if you consider all the directions, directions will work out so that there's a minus sign, as in if displacement is in one direction, net force is in the other direction. And the coefficient that comes here, whatever that is, that is the spring constant, or the effective spring constant. And so I will tell you, this is the one type of question that I won't ask you, that a lot of professors do like to ask. Uh, we covered the buoyancy force, right? So uh, the situation where there's an object floating on water, they can actually be treated like a spring system. Because if you push it down a little bit, there's a restoring force. The buoyancy force is greater than weight, so it gets pushed up. If you lift it up a little bit, there's a restoring force again. So you can actually work out the effective spring constant of that uh, buoyancy force situation. Now, I won't ask you that because, you know, I'm trying not to focus on uh, fluids. But that analysis uh, approach is the same. You, you try to write down this expression, and whatever comes here is your effective spring constant. And that's uh, you know, how you figure out A and D, right? With A and D, what you say is, all right, I'm going, so let's do it for A. D is actually easier, so let me do it for A. You say, I'm going to displace this mass a little bit. It's been displaced by some amount of delta x. Then let me draw the, um, uh, the forces that will be acting on it. I'm going to ignore gravity. I'll just uh, consider these two spring forces. So the spring on the top, it's been compressed. So it's going to push down with a force, um, for, with a force k times delta x. Right? That's the spring from the top. Spring on the bottom, it's been extended. So what direction will the force be? Also down, right? It'll be pulling downward. So the spring from the bottom will also apply force k delta x. So when you introduce this much displacement, what you get for net force is that net force is equal to, um, it's proportional to delta x, but there's two of these, 2k and the minus sign, since uh, displacement was upward and the uh, forces were downward. So that's how, you know, in the homework problem that you are thinking of, how it was worked out that effective spring constant is 2k. Let's try to use the similar analysis here. So let me imagine that I, um, how can I move this in a way that it doesn't, um, let me say I moved it up also. So let's say I moved this uh, block up by distance uh, delta x. All right. Um, how much are each spring being compressed by? Are they each being compressed by delta x? No, right? Because you know, they, if they're each being compressed by delta x, then the total displacement at the end will be two delta x, right? It'll be you know, delta x here, and then another delta x is shorter, so okay, so that doesn't work. I want the total displacement to be delta x, that means this, join, this joined portion of the spring moves up by delta x over 2. And 
this is um, this portion of the so after having accounted for this, the length of this spring gets compressed by um, so I, how do I express that? Let me just say it. length of the spring gets compressed by delta x over two. Essentially, this entire displacement delta x gets split into however many springs are there. Yeah. And here, you know, it's identical spring, so it's probably evenly distributed. So now what you can say is, well, so the force on mass, this spring is not really uh, touching the mass. The only thing that's touching the mass is this spring. And that spring uh, applies a force of, uh, applies a force of, uh, um, or uh, let me throw the proper free body diagram. So um, this uh, bottom spring here, it applies a force, downward the force of k times its own uh, change in length, meaning delta x over two. So, um, so the net force on the block is actually minus k over two delta x. I moved the two over to k. So delta x is still the entire displacement. But coming from that entire displacement, there's only half as much force as there would have been if you had the whole thing. Um, I can, so you know, that's the kind of analysis that uh, someone might have been able to go through. Or um, this is where probably a test taking strategy would have helped because it comes down to you can't eliminate A and D. So you're trying to choose between B and C. Um, I think I said this before. When you're using process of elimination, you must make your final guess randomly. Uh, if you, the entire point of a process of elimination is that you are increasing the likelihood of guessing the correct choice by, at random. If you didn't eliminate anything, your chance here would be one in 20 or 25% chance. Not very good. But you, if, you are if you are able to eliminate two of them, you can increase that chance to up to 50%. But once you start considering other things, like this has only one spring, so it must be smaller, then you throw away all the work you did with the elimination. At, at this point, if you are not sure which is it is, B or C, you should guess randomly so that you have some greater chance of guessing the correct one. So um, let me do the demonstration so that in case this analysis wasn't convincing enough, I can at least show you with a physical demo. Uh, this is not something that's uh, available to you during the exam. So this, you can't do this during the exam. But, um, but at least I can show it to you uh, that what I'm saying is true. So I don't know if uh, one kilogram is too much. All right, one kilogram is too much. Actually, uh, I can show it to you this way. So, you know, so one kilogram. If I use the entire length of the spring, like spring constant is not small enough for me to actually lift it, right? Now, let me use a smaller portion of the spring. I'm only going to use half of the spring. And watch. Spring constant is not great enough for me to actually lift it within this distance I have available to me. So a uh, spring constant, it's, uh, uh, it's something that's assigned to the entire spring. If you take a portion of the spring, Actually, if you take a smaller half of it, spring constant increases. When you make the spring longer, like you have done with um, attaching two springs together, that actually decreases the spring constant of the whole thing. Because you know, a given amount of displacement proportionally a smaller proportion of the entire spring length. That makes kind of sense, maybe, no? But, all right, yeah, but that's a good question. It's one of the examples of difficult questions that I expected a lot of people to miss. This is one of the most difficult multiple choice questions on the exam. And what I'm challenging you to, to do for yourself is uh, do what Ratanan did, as in question, okay, why did I miss it? What's the reason the correct choice is the correct choice? So that if you see either the exact same or similar question in the future, you won't miss it the second time. That you, know, you missed it the first time and that's the only time you're gonna miss it. <laughs>